Good morning and welcome to this Regulatory Transparency Project webinar. Today, our theme is the House Judiciary's Antitrust Staff Report. It's an important topic and we've gathered some very knowledgeable attorneys to discuss it with FTC Commissioner Noah Phillips. My name is Nate Kazmarek. I am Vice President and Director of the Regulatory Transparency Project for the Federal Society. Per usual, please note that all expressions of opinion are those of our guests today. We are, today we're mixing up the format a little bit and we're pleased to have uh, Svetlana Gans and Corin Wong Irvin to both interview Commissioner Phillips. Corin is a, a partner at Axon Veltrop Harkrider LLP. She previously served at the FTC as counsel for intellectual property and international antitrust and as an attorney advisor to Commissioner Josh Wright. Her experience includes representing defendants and plaintiffs in high stakes litigation and representing technology companies in domestic and foreign investigations. Svetlana serves as vice president and associate general counsel at NCTA, where she advances NCTA's policy positions on competition, privacy and advertising issues before federal agencies and Congress. Previously, she served as the Chief of Staff for FTC Acting Chairman Maureen Olhausen. She currently serves on the Council of the ABA Antitrust Section. If you'd like to learn more about all of our guests today, you can visit our uh, website, which is regproject.org. That's R-E-G-project.org, where we have uh, each of our guests' complete bios. In a moment, I'll turn it over to Svetlana. Once our panel has had ample, ample time to pepper the commissioner with questions, we'll go to audience Q&A. So please think of the questions you'd like to ask. Audience questions can be submitted via the Zoom chat function at the bottom of your screen. With that, uh, Svetlana Corinne, Commissioner Phillips, thank you very much for being with us today. Thanks Great, for thanks. having me, Nate. Thanks so much, Nate. Um, so thank you, Nate, and thank you to the entire FedSoc uh, team, Colton and Braun, for your assistance today. And thank you also to Commissioner Phillips' staff, Anna, for all her assistance for today's event. I am honored to introduce FTC Commissioner Noah Phillips uh, for this fireside chat this morning. Commissioner Phillips began his term as an FTC commissioner in May of 2018. Previously, uh, Noah served as chief counsel for Senator Cornyn of Texas on the Senate Judiciary Committee, where he advised the Senator on a variety of legal and policy issues. Since joining the FTC in 2018, Commissioner Phillips has been an avid proponent of strong IP rights, the rule of law, and agency transparency. Commissioner Phillips has written extensively on whether it is time to rewrite the antitrust laws, and we hope to hear many of his thoughts this morning in conjunction with our conversation today. So with that, I'd like to welcome Commissioner Phillips. Thanks, Fatwana. Great to be here with you. So um, Nate, Nate discussed a little bit of the format. Corinne and I will be uh, asking the commissioner some questions about the House report. We encourage you to please utilize the chat feature if you have any questions. And we'll also take questions at the end of the program about 10 minutes to 12. So with that, I'll turn it over to Corinne uh, to introduce the report. Great, thanks Svetlana and thanks Nate. Um, hello everyone, I am Corinne Wong Urban. And as just a little bit of background, on October 6th, the majority staff of the House Judiciary Committee uh, released about a 450-page report on antitrust. Now, the report is entitled Investigation of Competition in Digital Markets, but it's really important to take note that there's about a dozen recommendations that apply across industries not limited to digital markets. So these include things like interjecting vague and subjective standards such as democratic ideas into antitrust analysis, shifting burdens and creating presumptions of illegality for mergers and commonplace conduct, and even prohibiting beneficial product improvements, including for life-saving drugs, when they would make it more difficult for rivals to compete. There's also a number of recommendations that extend beyond antitrust. So things like removing safeguards and lessening standards for class action litigation and prohibiting so-called forced arbitration clauses in private agreements. So thank you, Commissioner Phillips, again, for joining us and, 
uh, for this discussion. And I will turn it back over to Svetlana to kick us off with some questions. Great, thank you so much, Corinne, for that overview. Uh, so uh, Commissioner uh, Phillips, I know you're gonna give us your usual disclaimer at the beginning, but after you do that, uh, can you give us kind of a brief overview of your thoughts about the report? Sure, thanks, Fetlana. The disclaimer being what I'm gonna say is my view and you know, not necessarily the view of the commission or my fellow commissioners. In terms of the report, I think I actually just begin as a former staffer. Right? I worked as a staffer on the Senate Judiciary Committee, not the House, for seven years. So I have some appreciation for the level of effort and thought that goes into a project of this size and scope. And it is a tremendous undertaking. I mean, the staff for the committee collected tons of documents. They spoke to lots of companies and experts. They convened really a wide ranging series of hearings and they've come up with a tremendous piece of work product. So I just, I have to start by saying, I think it reflects a lot of talent in execution. And as a staffer, a former staffer, I really appreciate that. That's not something that happens every day. And I, you know, I give kudos to, to the folks behind it. Um, that takes vision and it takes execution and those aren't always things um, in broad supply in the legislative world or, or even other parts of the world. Um, two other thoughts that jump to mind. First is that the report is one of a number of re similar reports that have looked at issues in the digital economy. We've seen that in Australia. There's the Furman report out of the UK. Um, there's the Stigler report out of the University of Chicago here. The list goes on actually beyond those. Of course, the EU has been putting out lots of paperwork. One of the things that makes this one more interesting is I think it is a little bit more of an indictment in the sense that it doesn't spend as much time dealing with the positive aspects of the companies on which it focus, on which it focuses. And while all of these companies deserve scrutiny uh, for purposes of antitrust and other issues like privacy, I think that um, understanding their position in the market um, and why they are so popular with consumers is a really important part of the story. And part of that understanding is understanding what they provide. And I think that that probably could have used a little bit more focus. But the thing that jumps out at me most and above all is the fact that the report focuses on four very large, very important companies. Um, but then it moves on from case studies of those companies to broad prescriptions for laws generally and reform of laws generally. And I do think that in order to get from a place of, we saw this concern with one or even four firms, although these are four very different firms with different business models, two, and so we need to do a fundamental change in the law that will affect all firms, I think requires more. Great, thank you, Commissioner. So let's move on to some of the specific proposals, uh, the, the broad-based ones like you mentioned. So one of the proposals is to ban firms with 30% or more market share from acquiring startups or nascent or potential competitors um, unless they prove a negative, right? Unless they prove that the merger will, will not cause harm to competition. So it's a shift of the burden. Um, the report also proposes that we would eliminate the existing requirement for plaintiffs to prove that absent the merger, there's a likelihood of entry, right? So that this is a real competitive threat, not just something that documents have said we, we plan to maybe enter, but, you know, a real capital request or something. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on uh, the proposal and what you think might be potential consequences for business for venture capital funding, for consumers, and for innovation? So to some extent, these proposals remind me of the proposal not so many months ago from Senator Warren and Representative Ocasio-Cortez uh, and Congressman Cicilline, uh, whose staff are the principal authors of the report that we're talking about today, to ban all mergers during the pandemic. Um, 
I wrote a bit and spoke a lot about why the factual predicate for such a ban uh, wasn't accurate, right? Merger filings were going down as they tend to do in a period of economic crisis, not rising. We weren't overwhelmed, which was the claim for why you needed an outright ban. But the way some of these proposals work, um, if you take into account how the agencies approach things like efficiencies today, which is, by the way, with a terrific amount of skepticism, um, what these amount to are real attempts to just chill M&A behavior in general um, and across a pretty, pretty wide swath of the economy. Um, and I don't think that's warranted. One of the things that concerns me when you talk about startups, in particular when you think about two areas on which we, the FTC, focus a great deal, and that is what we sort of colloquially these days call tech and biotech. These are ecosystems. They're ecosystems involving tremendous venture capital investment, investment predicated on some losers, some unicorns, and just a fair amount of M&A in the middle. Um, they're also ecosystems predicated on aqua hires, right? Hiring small companies uh, or, or acquiring IP, small companies with people. You know, there's a lot of writing um, and some of that writing underscores a lot of the interesting work that Chairman Cicilline has been doing on the impact of non-competes in the economy and in California. And there's a famous paper from years ago that looks at why is California so much more innovative than Massachusetts, my home state? One of the theories is that people move around a lot, right? They get hired to big companies. They learn how those big companies work. They leave those companies and they start their own companies. So stoking innovation through teaching people and watching them move around stoking innovation through incentivizing venture capital. These are good things. These are things that we don't want to get rid of. They've been part of America's economic success, not just in California, but elsewhere. And I think that we need to be pretty careful when we start talking about shutting down the systems that have generated so much economic growth, not to mention right benefits for consumers and innovation and patients um, that all of us care about. I think one of the things to think about is that the category of behavior is much broader than the few cases that are often cited to support the solution. And when you're talking about banning a wide swath of activity, much of which is good, affirmatively, a lot of which may be neutral, I think you're talking about throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And this is a pretty important, or these are pretty important babies. Thank you. So I wanted to turn to my one of my favorite topics, the consumer welfare standard. It's been the talk of the antitrust town for, for quite a while now. Um, the report uh, intends to uh, extend the consumer welfare standard uh, to not just protecting consumers, but also workers, entrepreneurs, and independent businesses, open markets, a fair economy, and democratic ideals. Uh, you recently wrote a speech um, on this topic as to whether you thought this approach would be administrable and um, kind of the correct approach. So I was curious as, if you could share your thoughts here. Yeah, so, you know, I kind of start with that old phrase, he who serves two masters serves none. And there are times where competition enforcement and consumer, consumer welfare can do a great job supporting lots of other values, just as in the corporate context, right, the pursuit of shareholder value can help create jobs for workers reduce prices for consumers, improve quality for them as well. Um, but explicitly as a matter of law, recognizing multiple different and often competing goals for a particular area of law enforcement or regulatory endeavor, oftentimes is a recipe for failure at all, on all counts, right? You're not gonna be as effective and it invites all sorts of gamesmanship. There's a, there's a famous quote you know, from years ago uh, by a really important antitrust enforcer at the Department of Justice about national security, um, wondering you know, where we would be if we just had to follow the dictates of the Department 
of defense on what we do. And I think that asking any kind of law enforcement agency, you know, whether you're doing shareholder protection at the SEC or you're doing consumer protection at the FTC uh, in the context of consumer welfare, to pursue multiple and opposing goals, I think it's, again, it's a recipe for not succeeding at any of those goals. Um, it also, again, can invite uh, gamesmanship and even really political intervention in ways that I think are ultimately counterproductive to the national interest. I will say this, one of the interesting things about that language in the report and some of the calls to broaden into like a public interest type standard, what today is the consumer welfare standard, um, is that they go up against other proposals to create bright line rules. Um, and to some extent, I think there is a dichotomy of thinking among antitrust reformers. Should we just be expanding what we're doing today in a kind of vague sense, and then we can pick our targets or pick what we think is bad, depending on a particular context, rather than a rule of law, versus those who say, like we were just talking about a moment ago, these bright line rules of, we're going to accept the cost of just banning positive things and just do away with everything. Thank you, Commissioner. I, I, I really appreciate your remarks. You know, when I think about antitrust and consumer welfare standard, I think about um, the fact that it gives it sort of it, it tethers antitrust to the methodological rigors of economics in terms of theories that can be tested and rejected, right, or tested and approved. And I don't know how you would test for employment versus consumer welfare versus you know all these different things. Um, so sure. let's move on to. Or, sorry, I was just going to add. Yeah. You know, there's an interesting corollary debate going on in the context of corporate governance today. Uh, you see this played out in statements back and forth uh, of the SEC commissioners uh, in you know, promulgating business roundtable and responses to it. You know, should we stop pursuing the welfare of our shareholders and instead look more broadly? And I think it invites, well, first of all, I think that debate is coming to antitrust, but also, I think it invites uh, the government in to sort of substitute its judgment for which stakeholders ought to win there in the context of corporate governance, here in the context of antitrust enforcement. Um, and I think there's a lot of mischief that can go on when we open that door. Yeah. And I think it's nice that this is one where we really have bipartisan support. I mean, when I was at the commission, uh, Chair, then Chairwoman Edith Ramirez gave a great speech in China, really talking about the lack of administrability and the um, the harm to credibility in antitrust, and also um, you know the risks of really harming consumer welfare, trading off short term static for long term dynamic. Um, so I'll just turn now back to one topic I mentioned in the intro, which is product design. So as I mentioned, the report would prohibit product designs. Um, that they say, you know, harm competition or harm what they call sort of the competitive process, regardless of the benefits to consumers. So as we know, under existing antitrust law, um, courts are very reluctant to judge what is a beneficial product improvement, right? They say courts are generally ill-equipped to do that. Um, so they're very deferential and also recognizing the empirical literature um, that there's tremendous benefits from even incremental or small product improvements. Um, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on this and what you think might be possible ramifications for innovation and consumers. Sure. Let me get to the ramifications in a minute. You know, to me, this very much lines up with some of the rhetoric uh, that we hear on the left, but also on the right about corporate power, right? The idea that the existence and the success of large corporations, including their ability to innovate and to expand into new markets, is itself a problem. That, if, if, if your lens for the world is generally fighting corporate power, whatever that means, and I submit that one of the things it means is people take views about how that power ought to be exercised, whether for workers, um, whether for consumers, uh, whether for the government, what have you. Um, if that's your lens, this kind of thinking makes sense, right? Because you're worried about 
allowing the already powerful to acquire more power. The problem, though, that I think it presents is it is a kind of bar on allowing large firms to compete. And that competition, whether it's by small firms or large firms, uh, benefits consumers, it lowers prices, it adds to innovation, it may disrupt industries that are very much in need of disruption, right? Uh, it may allow us to deal with the negative effects of regulation, right, which has skewed markets in a way that hurts consumers. And I think that that is not a place that we should want to go. Uh, I think, again, right, like large firms get more antitrust scrutiny than other firms. They deserve that scrutiny. That's absolutely fair. But taking the position that they cannot innovate, right, they cannot design products in ways that hurt their competitors, uh, hurt their competitors, by the way, perhaps by gaining market share because what they're offering is better. I think that's the wrong way to approach the question. So just to follow up a little bit on that and clarify, so when you talk about, you know, large firms sort of deserving, you know, I, I know you've written and talked before about, you know, without monopoly power, you really don't have the ability to foreclose. So it's sort of a necessary but not sufficient condition for a claim. But of course, in the U.S., being big is, is not bad or having monopoly power is not. So just, you know, if you could talk a little bit more about, you know, your statement. Sure. Right. I mean, being big is not a problem. Uh, it's not illegal. And in fact, as Justice Scalia wrote, right, the incentive to acquire monopoly power is part of what drives firms to compete in the way they do. But, right, Section 2 jurisprudence or monopolization jurisprudence, which, as you note, requires the existence of monopoly power in the first instance, um, does sometimes look at certain kinds of conduct differently when they're engaged in by a monopolist because foreclosure may be implicated, right? So a tying arrangement that might be innocuous uh, for a non-monopolist might not be innocuous uh, when undertaken by a monopolist. Uh, I suppose plausibly that would be true for certain kinds of product design, but what I don't think you want to do is draw lines where you're basically saying to large firms, don't compete, don't innovate, for the sole purpose of achieving the diminution in the size or power, however you're defining it, of that firm. Great. So, Corinne, did you want to ask a question? No. Okay. Um, so I wanted to um, talk a little bit about um, rulemaking under uh, the FTC Act. Um, the report recommends that um, the FTC undertake rulemaking using its unfair methods of competition authority. Um, uh, the FTC hasn't promulgated competition rules in quite a while, um, although some within the commission currently, like Commissioner Chopra and Slaughter, believe that this is an untapped resource. Um, what is your view on FTC rulemaking authority under Section 5 unfair methods of competition, and what would be uh, potential limiting principles there? Sure. So shortly after election night, I can't remember when, Zephyr Tichout, who was one of the witnesses at the final hearing uh, associated with the publication of the House Report, a professor at Fordham Law School, uh, tweeted that now the Democratic focus would shift to the FTC. So I don't know exactly what Professor Tichout meant by that. Uh, what I do know is that we're uh, an agency, right, an independent agency within the scheme of the federal government. Um, we sometimes make rules. But we're not a legislature, right? We're not supposed to be the focus of democratic action and political campaigns. Of course, right, we have comments that go along with rulemaking, not just rulemaking proposals, but also consents, and we listen to what folks say. Um, but where the behavior is legislative, it ought to be in the legislature. Right? That ought to be table stakes in our constitutional conversation. And so, when I hear about proposals uh, to make competition rules, you know, some of the questions that I ask are, did Congress give us this authority in the first instance? And I think that it's a rare judge today who approaches the rulemaking question the way the DC Circuit did on consumer protection rulemaking in the 1970s in uh, National Petroleum Engineers. I might be getting the name of the case wrong, 
So it's a rare judge who approaches that question that way today. And I think we also need to take into account, given what we were just talking about, right, the notion that antitrust should serve all of these different interests simultaneously, the notion that it has no limiting principle, right, that it is this sort of generalized government warrant to fight against an ill-defined power in the private sector. Where one's view of a law is so capacious, and my view of the law is not so capacious, but if that is your view of the law, I think this runs us right up into serious questions uh, about the non-delegation doctrine. So I'll give an example. If you go back and you read Schechter Poultry, right, where that doctrine comes from, They are grappling with the New Deal, which allowed the President of the United States to promulgate codes of fair competition. Now the proposal is to allow the FTC, not elected, to promulgate rules governing unfair methods of competition. At the time, no one was discussing us having rulemaking power. Right then, it was investigation power, and you were bringing cases or maybe re- making recommendations to Congress. But now we're talking about rulemaking, and so I have in mind Professor Teachout's tweet and the notion that we ought to act like a legislature. And as a person who spent a little bit of time studying the Constitution when I worked on the Senate Judiciary Committee, that gives me a lot of pause. Thank you. So let's turn to monopoly leveraging. So one of the recommendations is to override the legal requirement that for a monopoly leveraging claim, you need to show that there'll be actually monopol- actual monopolization in the second market, as, set, as is set out in Spectrum Sports versus um, McKillen. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. And you know, there's some case law even that talks about, like in the Ninth Circuit, that monopoly leveraging is not a standalone claim by itself. You know, you need like refusal to deal or or some other claim. And so, you know, the consequences of of lessening this for monopoly leveraging. Yeah, I mean, to me, those proposals speak very much to what we were all talking about a few minutes ago. And it's this notion that we ought to mend the law or bend the law in a way to prevent companies that have some kind of market power, right, in the context of monopoly leveraging, market A as opposed to market B, We ought to prevent them from competing, right? They're powerful enough already. We don't need more power from them. That's an argument. But what I think it puts squarely in view is the question of, should there be a point of size or something else where you just want to stop a firm from competing more? And I think it raises that same set of questions about What about those consumers who benefit from that competition? What if that company has a capability, logistical capability or what have you, that it can bring to bear um, that can benefit innovation and benefit consumers? And I think drawing the lines in a way that prevent companies from competing means we really drifted pretty far from what we had in mind when we adopted laws to protect and stoke competition. Right? We may be pursuing something, but competi- if you're saying you can't compete, competition uh, ain't that thing. Great. So along those lines, you talked about line drawing. Um, the majority staff report recommends two forms of structural separations to eliminate the perceived conflict of interest faced by a dominant firm when it operates in markets that place it in competition with businesses that benefit from its infrastructure. Um, Microsoft analyzed uh, structural separation and the DC circuit largely rejected that remedy in Microsoft. Um, The report, interestingly enough, uh, borrows heavily from from historical uh, regulation, for example, from the railroad industry um, and the airline industries, largely that have been outdated right now. Uh, What is your view of mandated Glass-Siegel's type of structural and business line separation as a matter of course? The first thing I'd say is it's important that everyone recognize the very mixed history of some of those regulatory schemes that were adopted to address concerns like this. 
I think it is fair to say that the history of railroad regulation in the United States is not a particularly good one. Um, and I don't know that it's a model that we really like. Glass-Steagall, you know, it was pulled down in the Clinton administration and it, that move kind of got a little egg on its face because of some concerns um, with regard to the financial crisis, right? That risks were created that shouldn't have been. Those are not the concerns that are animated here. I think it's fair to note in having this discussion that this behavior, right? I'm gonna speak in very broad strokes here, but having some sort of platform, competing on that platform, and maybe even preferencing yourself, um, at the very least is fairly widespread in the economy. I go to Costco, go to Costco on the shelf, there's the Kirkland brand, right next to the other brand that Costco is supplying. And I can look at them and I can evaluate their quality best I can. I can evaluate their price pretty easily. Um, and that's a pretty common thing that a lot of Americans deal with. And so I think the important thing here is to make that case for why either for a small subset of firms or otherwise for all the many firms in the economy that engage in this kind of behavior, you know, where you have this alleged conflict of interest, why that's bad. I think that um, government attempts to structure industries often don't end up pretty well. I think it reminds me of when Senator Warren rolled out her plan to break up three large tech companies at an event, can't remember exactly when it was, but I wanna say it was 2019, maybe 2018, and a reporter came up to her at the press conference after the announcement had been made and offered the name of a fourth company. Well, what about Apple? Uh, to which she responded, yeah, break them up too. I think we have to think with a little bit more care about what the firm is, what the conduct is, what is the industry that we're looking at um, before we arrive at pretty aggressive remedies to problems that don't necessarily present as problems in the first place. To be clear, it doesn't mean that you couldn't have harmful self-preferencing, right? Mm -hmm. A platform has opportunities to do things that other companies may not. And as I said before, monopolists, right, can engage in conduct that is otherwise okay, that is bad when a monopolist does it. But with that said, there's nothing to me that jumps out that makes all these firms common in a way that a common form of structural separation really would help. So let's move on to another proposal, which is to adopt a EU-like abuse of dominance standard, right? So the notion that uh, there's sort of special rules for monopolists, they need to you know, you can compete hard, pound the pavement, but once you become big, there's special rules. Uh, and one thing that's notable is that the report would create a presumption of dominance at 30%, which is even lower than the EU's. The EU's is around 40%. Uh, and in typical EU cases, it's usually 80 or 90%, <clears throat> perhaps because they define narrow markets. You know, one of the things in the report is it says, it suggests that current antitrust laws are harming the US economy. And so to me, it's an odd choice to adopt an EU-like uh, approach if you're trying to help the economy, given that um, by so many markers, the US is ahead, right? We have so many more innovative companies beginning in late stage financing. Um, you know, there are surveys by McKinsey and Company and others citing the regulatory burdens in EU. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on this and, and you know, what you think of, of this choice in particular and what it, the potential consequences might be. The first thing I note is my understanding is there's a proposal in the New York State Legislature to do this as well. I don't know where they set the threshold. My understanding is that is a process that is ongoing, animated by some of the very same advocates who very much support the House report. I think you're right, Karen, to note that Europe isn't necessarily the economic model that the US wants to follow, that we've got a lot of innovation that for all of its flaws and foibles remains the envy of the world. I think you see a lot of talk in Europe about, we want innovative technology companies or more innovative technology companies. We want competitors with the large US firms. 
And I think that if you had to choose a system to generate that, it would be the one that has it, not the one that doesn't. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that it's not clear to me that with European law the way it is, the Europeans feel that they're solving all the problems, whatever they feel those problems are. In fact, what you see right now in Europe is an incredibly vigorous regulatory environment. Um, scarcely a month passes where some new proposal is not up at the EU level to adopt new laws. They're thinking about ex ante regulation. They're thinking about new methods for enforcing or new tools, they call them, for antitrust law. It's not clear to me that the abuse of dominance standard is doing the work that they want. So if you can't make an argument that it is correlated with the kind of innovation that you want, and you don't view it as solving the problem where it is operative, it seems an odd solution to whatever problems you perceive. And just a follow up question on that. So one of the features of the EU like approach is they don't require actual competitive effects, right? They have a reasonably capable of standard that the conduct is capable of foreclosing and then they have an inference that substantial foreclosure of an equally efficient competitor could harm. But in the US, you know, we've traditionally, when you have backward looking conduct, said, well, we have a real world evidence of what happened. So let's see, did prices go up? Did output go down? Did innovation um, go up or down? So, you know, what are your thoughts on, on sort of the reasonably capable of for effects, not for causation, but for effects versus, you know, when you have backward looking conduct, should we actually be looking at like what really happened? The short answer is yes, we should. I think you're right to note that that reasonably capable language occurs, uh, pops up in Microsoft and it's in the causation test. And I do think that lessens the government or plaintiff's burdens um, with respect to causation. And I think that is not unwarranted, right? But to also do away with effects entirely, I think is the wrong move um, because you may end up punishing conduct that, harm, uh, that helps consumers. Great. So um, I just had one uh, question before we turn to audience Q&A. Um, and, and this is, you know, you mentioned Commissioner Phillips at the beginning that you praised the report for, for being a thoughtful piece um, after, uh, you know, a, a thorough investigation with congressional hearings, dozens of experts reports, thousands of pages of testimony. Um, and there are experts on both sides. Um, some wanted changes in the digital economy in terms of antitrust laws and some didn't. Um, at bottom though, there was a stark difference are on, on issues concerning industrial policy and the role of government, for example. Um, and you, you came to the FTC after serving as chief counsel in the Senate. Um, and I was just curious, wearing, wearing your, your former staffer hat as well as an FTC commissioner hat, where do we go from here in light of all of the differing opinions um, expressed throughout the congressional uh, hearing process on this issue? Look, I think the place we go is the legislative process. And in a sense, that's exactly the right way to do this, as opposed to, say, for instance, the rulemaking process. Congress, with the president, they get to set the policy. And so if they take a view that we ought to redo the law in a certain way, they're the right body to do that. They're the democratically responsive body. Um, they're the body that is held accountable for the decisions that they make. They can take that broad view with a lot of different things in mind, right? If they want to take into account workers, they can do that. Um, that's absolutely within the policy-making purview of the legislature. Where exactly we're going to end up, I'm a terrible prognosticator when it comes to what legislation will be adopted. The one thing I always tell Congress when I'm testifying, and I think is really important to keep in mind, is that you wanna focus on what the harms are that you're solving. Too much of the debate about tech is a lot of different issues that bleed into one another. So someone will be concerned about a content moderation decision and they'll say, break them up. Without a real grappling, I think with, well, how does a breakup solve that problem? By the same token, privacy, right? We have a lot of 
concerns about privacy with big tech companies, but also small companies. I think those are valid concerns. We ought to talk about them. We ought to legislate on them. But just assuming that competition will solve all the problems isn't always true for things that are not borne out by market forces. And so I think part of what Congress has to grapple with is, are we thinking about this <clears throat> as a competition issue versus some other kind of issue that we as Congress are perfectly entitled to legislate on? So before we go to Q&A from the audience, I just had a follow-up question. So, you know, with respect to the, the clearly a lot of work that was done on this, you know, some people would say that it's a lot of anecdotal evidence or, you know, citing studies on one side without the critique. So for the merger proposals, the only study cited is the, the Quoka one, you know, which has been widely criticized, right, including by Chairman Simons um, and, of course, the, the excellent work of Mike Vita and his colleague at the FTC. So some would say, you know, it's a, it's one-sided, right? And um, and maybe cherry pick some evidence. So for example, when they're saying that entrepreneurship is down, they cite data from the dot-com boom uh, through the Great Recession. And so, you know, for me, there's always a difference between a long report and, and clearly hard work, I'm, I no doubt, and, and, a, and a balanced report. Yeah, and I think I used the word indictment earlier, right, with respect to certain firms. I think that there's a lot of people uh, taking issue validly with a lot of underpinnings. You know, I, for one, would like to hear more legislators recognize that the data on falling innovation is not remotely as clear. In fact, it may be contrary, right? There's tons of money coming at companies at different stages of development. We can talk about why. We can talk about why we're moving to private markets as opposed to public offerings, why SPACs are hot right now, a lot of related issues. So I think that it is very fair you know, to, to make those criticisms, absolutely. What, what I meant to begin with, though, is as a staffer, I do think, you know, in terms of forming a political narrative, I, I don't agree, obviously, with everything in the report, but I think that they've done really good work advancing their view of the world. I don't share that view. And I think we ought to have a real debate. That's part of what the legislative process is for. But I don't think, uh, I think it is fair to say that the authors um, worked very hard and produced a product that helped advance their vision. So my very last question is, you, you know, so to me, when you have, you know, thriving innovation and in some markets, exponential output growth from certain acquisitions, you know, the burden is really on the party that wants to radically change antitrust to prove that we have some sort of a problem, you know, in search of a solution. And so, you know, we've talked about this on another panel on, on potential competition, and I've written a lot about it, kind of looking at the studies that are pointed to. Um, I think mostly they're pointing to theoretical, and of course, theory is important, but it doesn't tell us anything about whether we have systematic under-enforcement and harm to competition. So I'm wondering what you think about the available evidence. Is there sufficient evidence we have a problem? Um, do we need more? I want to step back for a minute and make the following claim, and people can quibble with it if they want to. We talk a lot lately in the US about this shift that happened in the late 70s and early 80s, uh, combination of jurisprudence and economic learning and enforcement priorities in the Reagan administration. And the claim is generally made that this was some sort of bad shift in antitrust enforcement. And this ended us up in, you know, whatever the claim, horrible situation we now inhabit. It's not clear to me that all the things that have happened since then in the economy, in particular, some of the target areas here are all that bad. The US has been terrifically innovative. We've seen a lot of growth, including of startups. Those are things that need to be taken into account in moving forward with how we rejigger the law, if we're going to rejigger the law. My preferred approach is to identify areas where it's clear we have problems and try to figure out what the best solutions are. Sometimes those are solutions that are going to be arrived at through the legislative process. They may even be related to competition law. I'll cite an example. 
Sometimes you'll hear my colleagues complain when we settle an antitrust action that we're not litigating enough. What I think that critique neglects is the fact that Congress was really concerned about messy litigation and breakups in the 1970s when they adopted the Hart Scott Rodino reforms to antitrust law. What Congress wanted was a neater, cleaner process that hurt fewer people. So they gave the agencies a look ahead of time at some of the deals that were happening. The fact that we have less litigation and can settle more things through consent is a feature, not a bug. But that was identifying a particular problem and a solution arrived at to address it. And I think it was a success. And my view is some of these problems might be problems with competition law. A lot of these problems aren't competition law problems. They may require regulatory solutions. Privacy is a good example. It's not clear to me that because of the way consumers reveal their preferences, that antitrust enforcement is going to solve the issue. And I think we just need to be clear about what are the problems we think we see? To your point about evidence, is it actually a problem, right? Is that borne out? Speaking in 90,000 foot generalities about corporate power, don't do that work. Great. So um, I think uh, we could turn to audience questions. We have uh, two questions so far. And uh, folks, if you do have a question, please um, please go to the chat. But let, let's ask the first two questions that we have. And, and the, this one it kind of along the lines of what we're discussing. The question is, my basic hope is that these horrific proposals get bogged down in the legislative process and don't go anywhere. But my fear is that there might be a bipartisan push for some reform because conservative populism is sympathetic to some of this. That might be the end of the golden age of antitrust. Do you have a sense of the politics of the issue? I mean, I think populist politics are part of this. Uh, this is not new to the American experience. Concern about, frankly, corporate power are not new to the American experience. That's some of what animated the Sherman Act in the first place. It's some of what animated the Clayton Act and the FTC Act and the Wilson administration, right? The statutes that. I spend a lot of time enforcing. And I think that's part of what we see today. Bill Kabasik has a great paper in 1989 about kind of waves in antitrust and the politics that they followed. And if you read that paper from 1989, 31 years ago today, it very much looks like the present. So I think that's, that's, a, that's a fairly accurate characterization. To me, the most important point is there are a lot of people angry at a lot of companies for a lot of different things. It's important to focus on the fact that a lot of these proposals go far broader than those companies. And to the extent you're predicating a broad-based legal change on a particular issue that you have, I do think the burden is on the proponent to demonstrate why we ought to effectuate that change more broadly with all of the consequences that that may have. So another question we got from the audience is, um, in the example of the Costco and self-preferencing harm, how do you view the argument which posits in digital markets and traditional stores, uh, that digital markets and traditional stores have different market structures due to network effects? Um, uh, does this parallel formalistic but uh, not functional? So, you know, are these markets different, right? Basically, you know, we saw that the ICN has a new report on this and some people say, oh, it's just so different, right? We got to have special rules, you know, with other people saying, well, you know, network effects can cut both ways. It's not, we don't need to throw out everything like you said earlier. So what are your thoughts on, on that? So I think, you know, it's fair to identify network effects as something that happens in certain kinds of markets with profound implications for how competition looks. That is an absolutely fair position to take. And I think to neglect the existence of network effects, uh, we'd be remiss. Those network effects can operate in beneficial ways as well. I suspect, for instance, that if, let's say, you know, Amazon Prime or just the Amazon website were not as popular, that many of the small sellers that gain access to markets through that would not be as benefited were it not for network effects. And whether those network effects are direct 
meaning your utility in using the thing is greater because of more people using it, or indirect, the utility of an advertiser is greater because more people use the product and thus you can push advertising to them. It's a much more fact specific question than simply say network effects. And so this or that solution is fine. Great. So one other question um, we received and, and you, you talked a little bit about it and, and Corinne did too, but the question says both the Cicilline report and Chairman Simons have been signaling increasing worry about the acquisition of nascent competitors. Do you share their worries that this problem is growing in an area deserving of more scrutiny? Let me start with the second part of the question. I do think this area is worthy of real scrutiny, right? We have brought cases, you could pick out the Illumina case, the Harry's razor case, identifying this or a version of this. There is really important literature in the pharmaceutical space about filler acquisitions, uh, which are a subspecies of nascent or potential competitions where the effect of the acquisition is apparently to take the thing off the market. Right? It's an absolute reduction in consumer welfare. So I think that's an area that we're scrutinizing more, that we should be scrutinizing more, and maybe our error cost framework is shifting a little. But I want to come back to something we were talking about earlier, and that is startups. Overcorrecting in this space uh, presents a real threat as well. And I don't think we should neglect the value to consumers, to competition, to innovation, to American competitiveness of the incredible market that we have investing in startups. It's great to live in a country where it's not hard to find capital. <laughs> For the most of world history, that has not been true. It's not even true in advanced capitalist democracies. We certainly don't need the government to be at, or want the government to be the principal backstop for providing capital at risk to businesses. You can imagine the disaster that that might be. And so when we think about these issues, and we need to be thinking about these issues, I do think we want to be very wary of overcorrecting. Okay, another question we got was, do you believe that non-structural remedies such as firewalls, or common ownership theories are still susceptible to similar concerns about chilling innovation? Um, that's an interesting question. I would say that, and this is consistent across agencies and enforcers, I have a general preference, especially when we're doing ex ante merger control for structural remedies. It's cleaner, it requires less supervision, although sometimes structural remedies, even in merger control, require some level of supervision just to get things off the ground. But as a general matter, that's my preference. I'm hesitant to shut the door absolutely to behavioral remedies because I think there may be times where a structural remedy for whatever reason just doesn't work and you can still preserve value in the merger. Sometimes we have to go to court um, to block things entirely where there's no problem, but definitely the preference is on the structural side for ex ante merger review. So a follow-up question to that do you, is, is to me, there's a little, there's a difficulty sometimes with defining what is a conduct remedy, right? So some people have said, we don't really like behavioral or conduct because it's more regulatory and requires ongoing um, overview. But for me in the AT&T Time Warner, the arbitration remedy that was proposed doesn't require that ongoing sort of regulatory, right? It was an independent tribunal that would be deciding so, you know, any thoughts about like, how do we decide and, um, and, and it was structural remedies is, you know, your answer sort of the same when it's long consummated, you know, 10 years ago, double click, should we still, you know, do structural breakup only? So I was, I think the preference that people articulate is, is in particular with respect to ex ante merger review, right? It's sort of giving effectuation to Congress's vision and Hart Scott Rodino that we settle as best we can things rather than having messy court fights. The longer on you go in time, the longer the court fight takes, um, the less confidence you probably have that a structural remedy will work. There may be integration that you're getting rid of and consumer loss. And you probably run up Karen into where you began your question with something that looks a lot more behavioral than it does structural. Right, because the process of just breaking things apart, it's not so easy. And the record on that by US enforcers is spotty. 
I gave a speech about that like a year ago, or probably more than a year ago at the Hudson Institute. And, you know, it, it kind of walks through two of the famous examples of st structural breakups much later on in the process, one of which was a really more of a merger case, that's standard oil, so it wasn't exclusively a merger case, and the other one of which AT&T, less so. A lot of people view AT&T as a very successful breakup, and I think that's important for us to keep in mind. But by the same token, even Standard Oil, right, the granddaddy of like antitrust enforcement, a canonical case for 17 different things in the world that we all occupy, was arguably not so successful, right? And in fact, one of the first things that the Federal Trade Commission was charged with doing in 1915 when we were started is trying to figure out why prices for oil were going up. And part of that may have been, a lot of people think, because you had taken an incredibly efficient distributor, the most efficient corporate um, or corporation probably in human history at that point, and or introduced inefficiency. And there may be benefits to that, um, but there also were costs. Such costs that, again, that was one of the first jobs of the fledgling Federal Trade Commission. So we have a couple more questions, but I notice we only have like a few minutes. I don't know if you want to give some closing remarks or take one more question, Commissioner. Um, I'm happy to take another question. Uh, I do have to go to a meeting at noon, uh, okay. but I'm happy to take a question. Svetlana, you want to pick one? Uh, sure. So um, I'll ask uh, one more question. Um, if Congress were to place all civil antitrust enforcement in one agency, which should Congress pick? So this was the topic of uh, an op-ed this morning in the Wall Street Journal by Senator Mike Lee. Uh, I am a fan of Senator Lee. I had the great privilege of working with him uh, and his staff for many years on the Senate Judiciary Committee. Uh, I don't support getting rid of the FTC's antitrust jurisdiction. I think we've done a lot of great work over the years. What I will say though, the problem Senator Lee is talking about in terms of clearance and having two agencies and being in court against one another, those are real problems. And I do hope that uh, his idea stokes conversation about how to solve them. Wonderful. Well, we know you have a meeting, so uh, and we, we really appreciate your time. So I think we'll close it here. Apologies to people we didn't get your questions. Um, but uh, thank you so much, Commissioner. And um, it's been a really fantastic discussion. Well, thank you guys for having me and thanks to FedSoc. I think FedSoc does as good a job as any organization for stoking important conversation about law, about philosophy, about policy, and I'm just uh, privileged to be a part of it. Wonderful. Thanks to our audience, everyone. Happy holidays and stay safe. Thanks.